Our next guest on Chuba Chuita is a former McKinsey consultant, Iron Man, and a proven Mr. Startup, who, among others, established AAsia X, iFlix, and his latest venture, Naluri. He's had the courage to take on giants, defy convention, and push boundaries, the DNA of a nation builder. Author of the bestseller, 30 Days and 30 Years, we welcome Azran Osman Rani. Assalamu alaikum and a very good day everyone. Uh, hi, I'm Coach Azman and we welcome you to another of our podcast series for today. And we've got a special guest who needs no introduction. Uh, welcome, Azran Osman Rani. How are you sir today? Thank you Azman. <laughs> very happy to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Azran, as you know, um, this series is about the DNA of nation builders. Ooh. But Nation building is not just about building highways, bridges, and infrastructure. Mm -hmm. What we really want to know is also those who have contributed in other ways, and especially what's within those leaders and people that mm -hmm. we interview on this show. So I'm really going to dive in to get to know you a bit more personally for okay. the pleasure of our listeners and viewers. Okay. Um, but I have to say, uh, I do know a lot about you. And the one thing that resonates is you are Mr. Startup. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to ask the very first question sure. you could share with us. Right. How was life starting up for you? My own life. Your own life, your personal, your personal experience, and even from your childhood. Okay. You know, um, if you've ever read the book by Malcolm Gladwell, Outliers. Okay. You know where he talks about ten thousand hours. Right. He also had a story about the Canadian ice hockey team, which had disproportionately high percentage of people born in January to March. Now, the reason for that is because you start the sport very early, three years old, four years old, five years old. Uh -huh. And that point, when you are January to March, you tend to be physically bigger than the kids born at the end of the year, right? Okay. And because you're physically bigger, you get selected more, and then you kind of progress faster into the um, all the different categories of competition. Okay. Now, I'm the opposite. I was born in December. You were born and in December. Not only was I born in December, I was born as a bit of a small kid. Oh. And as a result, growing up, you know how those days when we grew up, you, as a boy, you wanted to see whether you can play football or soccer with the boys. And I never got selected because okay. I wasn't big enough, I wasn't strong enough, right? All right. So I ended up learning very early on how to make my own games, oh. how to convince the younger kids to join me in my crazy pursuit of games, right? And this and, was just like playing as a child? You know, at the playground, right? Okay. At the taman. Okay. Um, and where was, where was home, I mean, for you in those days? Uh, so, seven years old, we moved to Tamantun. All right. So, Pasiaran Zaaba, grew okay. up there all the way until Form 5. Ah. Those were my formative years. But, okay. you know, you kind of learn how you adapt, how do you kind of create new games mm -hmm. when you don't fit into the conventional mold of your peers. And you're, 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 the, you're the eldest? I am the eldest. Yeah. And you have... A brother. I have a younger brother and a younger and sister. A younger sister. Yeah. So were they physically small built? No, no. My my brother is much bigger than much me. Bigger. Yes, yeah. He. And your parents? Uh, yeah, very but, kind of very modest. Uh, okay. You know, physically both oh. were academics, university lecturers. Okay. Uh, so very, very much about books at home. Oh, okay. Sorry, I interrupted you. So yeah. tell me more. So you you started. One thing I always find fascinating mm. about you, Azran, is you're so well read and you always refer right. to something that you've read, even right. statistically, right. To, to verify. Maybe we'll come back to that sure. a bit later. Right. But so. So, the one part is kind of creating new games. Okay. But there's also a very strong competitive streak, ah. right? I love the idea of competition. Now, because in those days when you grew up, if you were the physically stronger boys, mm -hmm. you would get selected to play football or mm -hmm. soccer in school, right? Mm -hmm. And I was never good enough to be selected in mm. for the school football team. The guys who were not selected ended up playing field hockey. Okay. 
But I was so excited just to be selected into a team to play field hockey. And I think the Tamanto and field hockey team was probably one of the worst in KL. You know, we would get beaten up by Victoria Institution, RMC, you know, 7-0, 9-0, 11-0. <laughs> but I just loved competing. Okay. All the way to when I went to university. And the very first thing I wanted to do when I got there was, hey, where's the field hockey team? Mm. Where can I join? Mm. And the Americans would say, dude, only girls play field hockey, <laughs> men play ice hockey. Ice hockey. Right? But of course, being a tropical small boy, ice hockey is not exactly a sport, right? Right. Uh, but then that led me to kind of meet other people, discover, and I found a sport that I eventually loved and shaped me to who I am today, which is ultimate frisbee. Right. Because it's a new sport. Okay. Right? Um, and, you know, I don't just want to learn how to play a sport. I was so obsessed with it, I wanted to be one of the best players in wow. the world. Wow. Right? So I would stay up until late at night with my friends, learning how to throw, learning how to throw it for the first year as a freshman year before I was finally selected into the Stanford team in mm -hmm. my second year. And by the time, you know, our final year before graduation, we were the number one ranked team mm -hmm. in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So this was Stanford University? Yeah. And let me guess that there were not very many Malaysians <laughs> no. at Stanford. No, there's probably only a handful of Malaysians at Stanford and okay. certainly only one that ever played for the competitive men's ultimate frisbee team. Okay. Since you mentioned that, mm. I'm just going to share something about this uh, Stanford University men's ultimate uh, okay. frisbee team. And I, 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 somewhat, I came across okay, it. Okay, right. And interestingly enough, they have this alumni... Yeah. Um, site that I discovered. Okay. Uh, they call it Internet Archive of Stanford University. Okay. It's called the Stanford Men's Ultimate Team. Right. And something that I picked up was about your defining characteristics. They describe you as someone who has a silly laugh, smile of merriment, rainbow shoelaces, <laughs> crazy disfix, ready with practical jokes day or night. What happened, Azran? <laughs> Well, you know, I still have rainbow socks, okay. so that, that counts for a bit. Um, but yeah, you know, it was my safe space in, in university, right? Because we were all trying to fit in in these formative years of our lives. Okay. And these were my close friends because you end up spending 10, 15 hours every week mm -hmm. uh, with them. Until mm -hmm. today, even just this year, I went back to California oh. for a reunion with my Stanford Ultimate team. Wow, wow. So after just all these years, just a couple months years, ago, yeah. You guys yeah. keep in touch. Yeah. Actually, I was just kidding you a bit mm. just now when I said what happened. <laughs> because when I first got to know you, yeah. in fact, when I first met you, I think it's about five, six years ago, right. um, I actually asked around, hey, you guys, does anyone know Azran? Right. Oh, he's a, he's a damn serious person, <laughs> man of few words doesn't carry a smile. Right. And I must say that that impression sort of like started when I first met you. Mm. But have you ever had that sort of feedback before? Oh, others? yeah, definitely, for sure. I think in a, uh, especially in professional settings, oh. even, even with my team members at work, right? Um, okay. Maybe sometimes there's a little bit of a image or persona that, uh, you know, as a leader, mm. you're meant to be firm, be decisive, be directional. Okay. Uh, although I've learned since then, and especially spending time with you, that we have to flex All right. how we lead, right? Okay. And we do need to kind of bring out more of the human side and, the, right. and build those connections. But it took some tough lessons for me to learn that. Okay. And I know um, there's a lot of lessons that mm. you know. It's, it's absolutely uh, brilliant in terms of what I've read about you as I got to know you over the years. Um, but I, we'll come to that, sure. especially even your book. Mm. Um, but going back to this persona that you said that as a leader, maybe in, at work, mm. so it's, it's actually intentional rather than something that you sort of like... Because I've, I've also met people, for example, who because of, they're always in deep thought. Mm. So they come across as someone who's very uh, strict and, and, and silent and reserved. Mm. What about you? How would you describe yourself? I do think I am extroverted because I know oh. I get my energy okay. when I'm with people, especially people that mean a lot to me. Oh. So I can derive energy externally. It doesn't come from within. Sometimes I do get anxious when I'm just by myself, right? Because oh. the thoughts are going at 
mm. too high of mm. a speed. Mm. Um, but I'm also selective. Selective? With the people that I spend time with. Right? Oh, I've yeah. learned that sometimes, whether it's individuals or groups, they can be draining. Right? And I try to spend less time with them. But I gravitate towards people and groups that energize me. Wow. Right? Or even activities that energize me versus activities that drain me. So I'm a lot more conscious of that now because mm-hmm. what I've learned is to move away from managing time because mm-hmm. time's a finite resource. Right? Mm-hmm. We all have 24-7. Mm-hmm. You can never do your full to-do list because we're mm-hmm. always running out of time. Mm-hmm. But energy is a renewable resource, human mm-hmm. energy. Mm-hmm. And you can do more with less time when you're mm-hmm. energized, right? So when you've got high levels of energy, you can complete one task in one hour, mm-hmm. whereas you're feeling drained, it's going to take you four, six hours to complete that same task. Okay. Now, energy, you have to know where's that energy coming from. And it's a function of who you spend time with, what activities you do, do. and what time of day or wow. day of week, right? Mm-hmm. So as you start to be more conscious of it, you start to learn, okay, I need to be more deliberate to spend time with the people who recharge my batteries mm. and spend less time with people who are going to drain me. Sometimes it's necessary and sometimes you have to have your batteries drained because that's part of the job, that's what's required. Mm-hmm. But then you need to know how do I go back and recharge my batteries. Wow, it's amazing. I mean, I'm so amazed by how much energy you have in such a small physique of yours <laughs> because what I know of you you are okay For sure. field hockey ultimate frisbee okay fine right. but now it's the marathons it's the the, the, the Ironman triathlons right. um, you are also into bungee jumping <laughs> base jumping I mean where does all this energy come from <laughs> and don't you have time to just like I mean, are you like right. like me? Maybe I just sometimes just want to sit back and just lay apart and not do anything? Rare. Very rare. Very rare. So you're like, in the morning, you get up straight away. Okay, what am I going to do next? And, like, and, ah, and your days are like, like it, chocolate block. It, it is very plan. structured. Structured. And generally, I work out six days a week, Tuesdays to Sundays, where uh, the, the more longer ones are Saturdays, Sundays. But Monday mornings uh-huh. is a very important time for me. Okay. That is my one weekly reflection time, morning to start the week. Also because it forces me to take one day off for the body to recover. Because you've had a very long Saturday and Sunday, you know, maybe like a long three-hour bike ride or two-hour run. Mm-hmm. So you're going to start Monday feeling, you got to give your body a chance to recover. Mm-hmm. And so on my calendar, 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. Monday mornings mm-hmm. is weekly reflection time. So you and are, are doggedly strict about that? Strict as in 80 to 90% compliance. Because sometimes, That's you know, right. something happens. Sure, like sure. even yesterday, yeah. there was a client workshop that started at 8.30 in the morning on Monday. Uh-huh. Now you got to adapt. you got to leave the house at 7.30, etc. Um, so you won't necessarily get everything 100% done. But I would say 80 to 90% of my Monday mornings, I have a journal. I have a place that I sit down. I've got my cup of hot water with lemon or lime. And it's one hour of reflection. Fantastic. Amazing. Amazing. Mm. And all of this started from the time you decided to play field hockey in Taman no, Tun? No, of course not. At what no. stage? I mean, was there a point in time or in your life mm. where you maybe reflected and say, hey, I need to be more organized. I want to do more with mm. my time. I want to really get to do, mm. you know, energetic things. Um, you know, sometimes you look back and you think there were crazy years. And I would say... 2013 was I look back and I think I have no idea how I accomplished what I accomplished in 2013 okay tell me more but that was also you know maybe 2012 2013 was the year when everything came together so first that was the year number one we had to complete the IPO exercise of AirAgeX and if you've ever gone through an IPO exercise you know it involves months of intense meetings writing a prospectus reviewing every single line with a lawyer Mm. weeks and weeks of pitches to investors we had to go on road shows KL Mm. Singapore Hong Kong Mm. London Boston New York San Francisco right and then deal with the whole IPO process media interviews Mm. and at the same time that was the year I started on 1st January 2013 with a couple of coaches, a swimming coach and a triathlon coach, 
And December 8, 2013 was the year I completed my first full Ironman triathlon in Australia. Okay. That means you've got to put in all of this crazy work requirements and fit in an Ironman training schedule. So you then learn to be very deliberate about time, very deliberate about energy to get a lot done. Mm-hmm. But these are, these are exceptional years. It's not every year like that. But, you know, that's, that's kind of, for me, I think the, the inflection point, right? When you realize, wow, if I could have done that, yeah. what's stopping me from doing more this year or the mm-hmm. next year? So t- share with me, I mean, tell mm-hmm. us more a bit about, you know, in reflection mm-hmm. now, I guess mm-hmm. these sort of stories are coming back in your mind. Mm-hmm. Um, was there maybe an impetus to sort of like do more now that you've achieved certain things? I mean, I can imagine, I can, mm-hmm. you, know, mm-hmm. you know, IPO and of course, you, you know, you've, you founded Asia X, you pumped in your mm-hmm. own money, mm-hmm. you know, and it, it was like make or break mm-hmm. sort of situation. And on top of that, mm-hmm. you're still training for other things. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's fine, you can find the time. Mm-hmm. But at what point do you feel in reflection that the, the level of satisfaction comes up with that? achievement hmm well I've learned that uh, that sense of satisfaction or that sense of personal accomplishment comes from within okay. but I also enjoy the process of uh, learning something new that's mm. why maybe part of the reason I get that startup label is I get very excited in the first formative years of building a new venture, mm. right? Because you're starting from scratch, from a blank sheet of paper, you've got to put a whole team together. Once it becomes a public listed company with audit committees <laughs> and risk management <laughs> committees and quarterly reporting, okay, that's time for to pass the reins to a steady hand to hold, helm the mm. ship because I'm that crazy guy that rocks the boat. Mm. Likewise, I, I flex afterwards and, and Nellery now, right? Okay. Um, so if you think back to that journey, 2008, yeah. it just so happens that AirAsia was asked to sponsor the inaugural Borneo Marathon. Okay. And as a leader, I felt, okay, you know what, let me rally my team members and go and support this event, right? So we got about 50 of our employees to go mm-hmm. run and, mm-hmm. and I have to like lead by example, so mm-hmm. I signed up for the 10K run. Mm-hmm. Now I thought 10 kilometers was an insane amount of effort to run 10K huffing and puffing because I was kind of out of shape then. And that race finished at the stadium, stadium in uh, Kota Kinabalu. And we had to wait for the few team members who signed up and ran in the 42 kilometer full marathon. And we finally waited and we saw them coming into the finish line in the stadium with the biggest smiles on their face. And I was thinking, they just ran more than four times what I did. Mm -hmm. I thought my lungs and guts were coming out. Mm -hmm. And they're doing that. And at the same time, you could see the grandmothers and grandfathers who also completed a full 42 kilometer marathon. Wow. Wow. So I get excited when I see others yeah. doing something that in my mind thought that's impossible. And then I get curious, how do they do it? Could I do the same? Mm. Right? And, and mm. that started a journey of, uh, you know, for example, I thought, oh, maybe this is exciting. I, I, maybe I should take up this running thing. So I went back to KL and I signed up for the next race, which was a 15 kilometer run at Lake Gardens. At the end of that race, I collapsed, fainted, and had to be put in the St. John's ambulance. <laughs> oh my goodness. Which goes to show, just because you've got willpower, determination, <laughs> but if you don't know what you're doing, right, you can get in trouble, right? And, and that's also where I disc- someone suggested, you know, maybe you should talk to a running coach, ah. right? To learn the basics, the fundamentals, Right to guide and, and it was it was really eye opening man because, you know the coach uh, that I met um, he said okay I'm gonna first do some diagnostics assessments right put me on a treadmill mm-hmm. measured everything oxygen mm-hmm. carbon dioxide measured my blood lactate levels mm-hmm. every five minutes mm-hmm. and then he came up and he said okay you know what to start to build a foundation I need you to wear a heart rate monitor okay and just spend the next few months running only at the zone. 120 to 135 beats per minute. Mm. Like, okay. The very next day, I called him up and said, hey, I don't think this is going to work because even with a light jog, I was well past 140, 
150. As in your heart rate? My heart rate, right? Which so he should said, have been maybe about 120 or right. something. So yeah. he said, slow down. I said, mm. but if I'm slowing down, I'm walking. Then he goes, well, then walk. But I said, <laughs> my grandmother can run faster than this, right? <laughs> I'm sure I can run fast. He said, that's not the point. The point is not whether you can run fast. The uh, point is to build the foundation first. Okay. So you got to learn to walk. Okay. Right? And after a few months of walking, you can pick up the pace and continue to run while still at that 120 to 135 heart rate zone. Mm. And that eventually led to a, a series of marathon runs and even being able to run full marathons at under four hours mm. because that foundation is built. Right. Right. And so that always got me curious to say, you know what, whenever you want to do something, mm -hmm. find people who know what they're doing. Okay. Learn from them. Mm -hmm. Right. But enjoy that process of mm. learning and discovery. Fantastic. And so that's, I think I've, I've observed this in you. Mm you are never shy of wanting to go to basics mm. and something that really stood out and I, I don't know whether the readers and listeners have actually uh, heard this right. but when you've, you might you migrated from running marathons right. to taking up triathlon yes. without even knowing how to swim and going back to basic with kids in learning how to breathe yeah. underwater yeah 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 why did you so I mean first of all I grew up, maybe like you, in the 1970s. Okay. And we were shaped because we had not one, not two, but three Jaws movies. Okay. <laughs> right? Yeah. And so every time the family would go to Port Dixon, I was terrified of going into the sea. Oh. Because okay. there might be sharks, yeah. there might be currents, it'll pull you in, pull right? You in. Yeah. So that fear made me not even want to learn how to swim. Mm. And whenever you go to the beach and you don't have to swim, because you avoid what you fear, it actually fuels and amplifies your fear. Mm. So the more you avoid what you fear, the more that fear grows in you, mm. right? But at 40, interestingly, maybe 40 is that midlife crisis point mm -hmm. and you're in a very reflective state of life and some of my marathon running friends said, hey, we're trying out this new sport called triathlon. And, and that involves swimming in the open sea in the first leg. And I said, no, 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 I don't swim. I can't swim. I can imagine. Yeah, yeah, right? But they, they then said, well, what would if they just start? Take a swimming lesson. And they said, go see May. May has a small, tiny pool in her backyard in Bangsar, and, and she teaches basic swimming. With kids? With kids, right? So I'm you like, literally were in the I'm pool. Like, okay, let me call <laughs> May up. And tiny, tiny pool, right? Uh -huh. And it was with five-year-old kids. And it yeah. was, lesson one was literally just put head in the water and blow bubbles. Serious. So other and other the kids parents, were better than me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not just that. I'm sure the other parents coming along to send their kids are kind of like concerned. Why is Azran getting into the pool with my kids? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? But and lesson two was she would throw coins at the bottom of the pool, and you got to pick it up, right? All right. And again, okay. those kids were faster than me. <laughs> but that process, right? Of like, okay, and. After a few months, I'm like, hey, you know what? I think I can swim, breaststroke. I'm comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'm ready to sign up for my first triathlon race. Oh, okay. And I thought I was smart because I found a very small, short race in Putrajaya Lake. Okay. okay. So I'm like, ah, lake. No shark. No shark. No big waves. No, no, no currents, currents, right? But what I didn't anticipate was you start the race with hundreds of other people jumping into the lake with wow. you. Wow. Wow. splashing, kicking, oh. like, like being in a washing machine tumble cycle, right? Wow. Within 50 meters, I was already swallowing water, gulping, panicking, hyperventilating, and I couldn't carry on. I had to put up my hand and, and mm -hmm. had to be rescued by the lifeguards. Wow, wow. But there's another side of me, which is I really hate to fail. Ah, right? tell me more. Tell so, me more. okay, I need, I need to upgrade. I okay. need to find another coach who will help me go to the sea okay. and uh, find another coach, uh, Azmir. And for three to four months, every weekend, without fail, we would drive all the way down to Port Dixon. And he would help me get into the water, hang on to a safety buoy, and we would go out 300, 400 meters out into the mm -hmm. deep sea. And mm -hmm. I'm holding on to the buoy. Mm -hmm. Then he'll say, okay, now I'm going to let go. I want you to let go, but I'll just be five meters away. Can you swim right five and ten and within a few months i could swim all 300 meters okay. from the deepest part of the sea back to the beach 
So when you do a triathlon, it's like one length. Is no, no, no. It's a whole lap, right? Yeah. I thought, okay, I okay. can deal with swimming in the deep sea. Right, right. So then I signed up for my next triathlon race. It was okay. a half Ironman distance in Singapore, you know, East Coast uh, Park. Okay. And the race is on a Sunday. Saturday, they allow you to do a test swim, right? right? The loop in the sea. And I could complete that loop. Mm-hmm. I was so excited for Sunday morning, right? Mm. Now, Sunday morning, again, you're jumping into the water mm-hmm. with hundreds, maybe a thousand people into the sea at the same time. The start was okay because we're all spread out on the beach. Okay. But 300 meters out, 300 meters is far. The water starts to suddenly get cold mm-hmm. and deep, and you can start to see the big ships and oil tankers getting mm-hmm. closer. Mm-hmm. Then the first right hand turn at the buoy. Okay. And everyone is squeezing to turn right around the buoy, right? Ah, because you want to minimize the imagine. distance. Mm. And at that point, you get squished into the crowd. People are pushing you under the water, mm. pulling your legs so that they can move forward. Mm. And again, same thing gulped, hyperventilated, panicked. And within a few meters, I had to put up my hand. And, uh, be rescued by the lifeguard. Mm. Another failure. Mm. Oh, I really, really hate to fail. But, I mean, you know, maybe something coming out of that Mm. actually was the ability to learn how to remain calm in Mm. times of this so-called turbulence, Mm. right? Ah, Ah. so then that led me to the curiosity. What's holding me back? Mm. So I found my third swimming coach, Hafiz Saleh. Okay. Sea Games gold medalist. And he said, okay, if you want to work with me, uh-huh. we're going to start in your pool at 6 a.m. in the dark. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You got to commit five days a week. Okay. Because swimming is about repetition. Mm. You can't do it once or twice a week. Mm. And we started 1st January 2013. Mm. And by December 8th, mm-hmm. I could do that first full Ironman race. Mm. But the other thing that Hafiz did was... Mm-hmm to help me conquer that fear. Mm. He, for example, took me to the National Aquatic Center at Bukit Jalil, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the diving pool. The diving pool is five meters deep. Okay, yep. And he would take me all the way down and just says, be down there and learn to just be present underwater. Five meters down. Four meters, five meters down, right? So it's scary, it's scary, but you can do it, you can do it. But even, even to remain submerged, that, yes. that, that is something. Yes, right? Wow. Uh, and then he said, okay, this is not working out. Let me introduce you to a hypnotherapist. <laughs> right? Because you have some really deep-seated fears oh. of drowning, right? Let's explore that. And we eventually, after a few sessions, came up with a ritual, Mm. to start the swim because at the start of the swim the start of anything new is when that first sense of panic is Mm. at its highest right Mm -hmm. so I have to go through even till today that fear never went away Mm. but I've learned to not let that fear hold me back from starting right Right. so to get me in the mode of starting to swim I have a ritual what I say Mm. um, you know to kind of in a way ask for permission from the sea like I'm going to be here mm-hmm. I'm going to be ready mm-hmm. and then in the first one minute of swimming mm-hmm. there's a whole mental exercise on right hand and left hand and breathing and check my hip and check my legs and mm-hmm. just get into a routine mm-hmm. because if you don't have something specific to tell your brain to focus on mm-hmm. guess where the brain is going to focus on mm. worst case scenario mm. drowning right so you've got to kind of let the brain or fill the brain up with specific thoughts, right? Just mm. the mechanics of swimming. Because once you can get through one to two minutes, then you can get into a steady rhythm mm. and you can probably continue. Mm. But it's that one of first one or two minutes that's the most crucial, mm. right? And, and kind of that whole process helped me understand how do you handle fear? Fear is not about not being afraid. You will mm. always be afraid. Mm-hmm. But to recognize the fear and to have a way to still move forward, even Mm -hmm. in the face of fear. Mm, It's amazing, amazing. So, um, so far what I've heard, trying to summarize in a way, is 
you know, you grew up with the acknowledgement that you may not be as physically uh, as well built as others. So you found ways, curiosity was part of your ways of finding other games to play. Um, you, you know, grew up in playing other non-conventional sports like your, your Frisbee and you made, you made the ultimate uh, Frisbee team at Stanford and I understand that's one of the top teams in the US. So you strive for certain things and I noticed also there's a trend for you to constantly try new things mm. but particularly what I also feel I understand about you is that it's okay if I have to go back to basics. Mm. You know, I think that story about you, know, you learning even how to breathe underwater with the kids is very humbling. Mm. And I think sometimes we do forget that it's okay to try and but enjoy that. Mm. And you're also very methodological. <laughs> I hope that's the right word to use. You know, you're so structured. And I guess that brings a sense of satisfaction of achievement to you also. Probably, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 okay. Now, I mean, I, I, I think at this point, I must refer to this book oh, of yours. Okay, yeah, right. and, and I must say, it's a, it's a really good, uh, it's a really great read, right. 30 Days and 30 Years. Right. Um, and you know, I, I would encourage um, you know, viewers and, and, and listeners uh, to pick up this book if you haven't. Maybe it's maybe it's something that um, you know will will inspire you. But what I do find there's a lot of personal anecdotes about you, Azran. Mm. And um, I'm now maybe I, I I don't like to use the word failure, but maybe let's try mm. to rephrase it like sure. setback. Mm. And you actually open this book with the story of you having that. Um, Quite a quite a, a life uh, threatening accident. Uh, you were cycling one morning and someone hit you from behind, and I know there were multiple fractures, even maybe some bleeding in the brain. But what essentially happened? Um, what can, maybe if I can just re ask this question: What was the first thing that came to your mind when you regained consciousness? Oh, the first thing was just sheer fear and terror, really? uh, because naturally. I was overwhelmed, right? Lying in that hospital bed. Um, am I going to be able to walk again? Um, what's going to happen to this new company that I just started? The employees that I just hired? Mm -hmm. How will I provide for my family? Right? So it was just completely overwhelming. So, so those are the first thoughts that come to your completely. mind? Completely. It was paralyzing. Mm -hmm. It was paralyzing. Do you so, like, I'm sorry, like, I'm I mean, sure. like, you be just trying to imagine you in that situation. Mm -hmm. I mean, Obviously, you don't know your physical condition, whether you, how alive are you, if you are mm. alive. Um, was there maybe a certain sort of like, uh, with all due respect now, you know, a very negative feeling about what was happening to you? Are you Very much. I mean, I, I had this big scar because that's where one of the pieces of glass went through the back of my head. And that was always painful because you're trying to lie on the pillow, but it's uh -huh. always pressing against the, mm -hmm. the big wound. Uh, pain and you know eventually I had to deal with five different painkiller medications um, so number one it, you know it was it was definitely terrifying it was paralyzing I had no idea what to do and it took me a few days to with the help of family members and my colleagues to help me process that situation to realize that all those terrifying big questions that were floating in my head and mm. they were going at 120 kilometers an hour mm. there was no way to answer them mm. lying in the hospital I couldn't find answers what am I going to do and I have to reorient my focus on what are the things I can control mm. even if it's really small even mm. if it is by day seven scooting off the bed and trying to get up and and with the help of the um physiotherapist to just walk five meters to the nurse's desk mm. and walk mm. five meters back mm. right and mm. just focus on that mm. what are things you can control today mm. good get up the next day maybe this time we'll do 10 meters mm -hmm. then the next day 20 meters and by the mm. time i was discharged and went back home on day 33 mm. okay let's carry that on on the treadmill mm. five minutes a day 10 minutes a day 15 20 Day 47, hey, I can start jogging and picking up the pace and start to mm. run on the treadmill. Mm. Day 66, you know what, let me go on the road mm. and, and cycle. Mm. And day 84 was mm. a very important psychological milestone. Mm. On my own, I think I would have been terrified of 
cycling back on the Malaysian roads. Mm-hmm. But at 19 of my friends from my cycling club mm-hmm. in Bukit Jelutong saying, we're going to have a ride with us one day. Mm. Right? We're going to be with you, like mm. get you on the back on the bike. Right? Mm. And because of that support system, mm. I was mm. able to get back on the bike. And once mm. you're on the bike, you feel, hey, this is good. Mm. This is good. Mm. Right? Day 112, my broken shoulder had healed enough I can mm. get a full rotation. Yeah. Back in the pool. Mm. Swim. Wow, mm. this is exciting, right? Get mm. out of the pool. Go online. Mm. Let me book a spot at the Ironman <laughs> Triathlon <laughs> yeah. Race in Langkawi. But it, I didn't start with that. Yeah. But it was the process of small, sikit, yeah. sikit, sikit. And in that whole process... From the people who were with me on that bed mm. to the cycling buddies, mm. the people that you choose to surround yourself with. It's important. Right? Because they're the ones who can guide you. On mm. my own, I, ne- I wouldn't have been able to do it by myself. I, in fact, there's, um, um, there's a whole story about your recovery. Mm. And alhamdulillah, um, you talked about guidance. Mm-hmm. Uh, I apologize if this touches a bit more of a personal nerve. Mm. But... I'm just reflecting mm. on if I were in that situation, mm. if, is there a particular point where you look up and say, where is this divine intervention coming? Mm. Uh, what is it that's beyond maybe my own personal control in mm. terms of surviving and recovering? Mm. How does that resonate with you? Well, you know, for me, uh, being reflective is important. But I also feel that... Uh, as a person, yes, you can reach out and seek strength and support spiritually. Mm-hmm. But it's also important to not be feeling like I'm just leaving my hands mm. to someone else. Fate. Fate, right? Ultimately, our fate is in our hands, mm. right? And I was always focused on, okay, what would God want me to do? You cannot control what happens to you, Mm -hmm. but you can decide how you choose to respond. Mm -hmm. We are always tested Mm -hmm. on this earth, right? You can never control what happens to you, but you can choose how to respond. And you can respond as a victim, or you can respond as someone who says, step one, take the first five steps. Mm -hmm. Step two, take 10 steps. Mm -hmm. Bit by bit. Mm -hmm. Step one, Mm. Put water in head, blow bubbles. Mm. Step two, go under four feet of water and pick up the coins. Mm. Step by step. So it's very methodological, mm. structured. Mm. Okay. I'm going to bring us mm. now, if, I can, if we can relate to some of the stories mm. about your business and experience. And you mm. share a lot of lessons in this book, I must mm. say. Thank you so much. One key lesson that mm. you explicitly say often enough in this book or so is that there's no use planning too long Mm. Uh, plans are most likely to fail Mm. and yet isn't that being methodological isn't that being structured okay maybe let me clarify there's a reason Mm. why I called the book 30 days and 30 years okay and it actually talks about planning horizons okay where I feel we need to move away from is this fixation on one year plans Mm. annual plan annual budget annual performance appraisal, new year resolutions, or three to five year strategic plans. (laughs) Because the world that we live in today is changing much faster than 12 months. January 2022, forget about COVID, but how many predicted that Russia would invade Ukraine in February? That inflation would be at 40 year highs, that ringgit would touch 4.78 to the dollar, Mm. that we would run out of cooking oil and chicken. (laughs) <laughs> right that was only February yeah right so what I focus on is to say actually what matters is two different time horizons 30 days and 30 years so 30 days means yeah we, we can have a plan but at the very least maybe every Friday afternoon for me but every 30 days step back what's going well what's not going well what's changed in our environment right whether new technology, changes in regulation, something that's coming up with another industry, to just see what are the things that are happening on the periphery and what you need to adjust along Mm. the way. Mm. So that while other people might review their business plans once a year, Mm -hmm. we're updating and refreshing every month. Mm. But if you only focus on short-term adjustments, 
you could run into the danger of running around in circles. Exactly, exactly. So you need a much longer time horizon. And okay. I would argue not three years, not five years, mm -hmm. but 30 years. And the reason for wow. 30 years is if you were to define what are the things that will not change in 30 years that become like your pillars, your objectives, right? Mm -hmm. How are you going to make a dent in the universe? And 30 years is important because it allows your mind to let go of short-term constraints like budget limitations, technology restrictions, regulatory limitations, and just say what really matters, right? And when you can define that, that becomes the anchor or the compass to guide your 30-day refining, right? Every 30 days, mm -hmm. what do I need to change? What do I do? But the 30 years is the why. Why am I doing it? Wow. Right? So let me, let me give a very specific okay, example. Please. Right, When we started AirAsia X, okay. our 30 years, mm -hmm. right, you say, well, what will never change is if our goal really was now everyone can fly and mm -hmm. now everyone can fly anywhere around the world, mm -hmm. well, what do you need to make that happen? I've got to fly everywhere. That means I've got to have planes. I've got to have routes and destinations. But if you want everyone to fly, you have to be the world's most affordable airline which means you have to have the world's lowest unit cost airline operations. But affordability is not enough. You also have to be reliable, mm -hmm. right? Can you be an industry leading level of reliability? Mm -hmm. But if you're cheap, you're reliable, but you're not convenient, people aren't gonna use you, right? So you have to be really convenient, easy to use. Mm. If you can define in our case, size, affordability, reliability, convenience, and the way we made it easy for everybody to understand, mm -hmm. one, two, three, four. We just said one, even as a small player, we're gonna be a one billion US dollar company. That idea of size and that idea that every dollar of revenue contributes to our size, our planes, our routes. Two, we want to have a unit cost of two cents per seat per kilometer. Mm. Every cent counts. World's lowest unit cost. Mm. Three, three out of every four hours, the plane is in the air. Mm -hmm. 18 hour aircraft utilization. That means you've got to be super reliable. Yeah. Four, four out of every five seats must mm. be filled with happy customers. 80% mm. mm. load factor, but yeah. customers who are returning. Yeah. So one, two, three, four, which means anything you do every 30 years, does it help you with one? Does it help you with two? Does it help you with three? Does it help you with four? Mm -hmm. So the one, two, three, four are things that don't change. But doesn't, isn't 30 years maybe, I know it's, it's mm. nice to envision what mm. life would be in mm. 30 years. Number one, our careers mm. itself may not mm. last 30 years. But I, I, I can appreciate the, the long-term mm. uh, visioning mm. and even allowing that vision mm. to never even, mm. we, we experience it ourselves. So it's like in, throwing away mm. all the in inhibitions. Mm. Um, but at the same time, I, what I hear is that you make a lot of adjustments. Mm -hmm. What I also read in this book is it's not just you planned it and jadi. There's a lot of, of course. reworking, yes. a lot of simple exactly. ideas which became brilliant ideas. And many more that failed. And many more that failed. Yes. And acknowledging that failed. Yeah. That, I would use the word failure, setbacks. I think mm. one testimony, let's mm. be honest, and mm. without, you know, with some level of pride, is that AirAsia X is mm. still, AirAsia is a company till today, mm. is, mm. in spite of all the, in fact, there's so much about what happened which mm. was beyond control, mm. but Till today, it's still, mm. you know, uh, flying as mm. uh, flying as an airline, sustainable as a company, and of course serving the, the people of our mm. nation at the very mm. least, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that that's, that is testimony to those ideas, or not even if you're not mm. part of it anymore. Um, but maybe at this juncture, mm. I'd also like to find out from you. You are Mr. Startup. You did say that when it becomes operational, it becomes a mm. bit boring, and you're mm. looking for something else. Um, but how do you reflect on when you started up something, it's for you to maybe, um, how would I say, do you start up something with an, with an ambition that there is an end goal in mind? Mm. Or I do you just, yeah. you just like starting it up? And see uh, I, I definitely, definitely love starting something up. Okay. But for me, the, the thing that really I get the most energy from is building a team. Ah. Right. Building a team of leaders. Wow, tell me more. And getting to the point where they can lead without you. Right? Mm. Um, you know, so maybe Nullery is a, you know, a good example of that, right? I mean, mm -hmm. number one, realizing 
if you can try to disrupt an industry, it's very hard to do that purely as an outsider. You need someone who's in there, who understands how it works, and can also be open and be a good sparring partner. Uh, and that's how I found Dr. Jeremy Ting, healthcare mm. system specialist, mm. works with both hospitals and insurance companies, but yet really excited about the prospect of transforming healthcare. Mm. And very quickly, Jeremy and I decided once you know, we could raise capital, mm -hmm. okay, well, for this to really grow, we've got to have a very strong team, mm. right? And it is finding people like Aiden and Tiffany and Ahmad and Kenneth, right? Mm. And really helping to nurture them and put them, make them uncomfortable in leadership roles and taking mm. on assignments that really stretch them. Mm. Once you, know, once you know that, hey, you know what, they can actually lead and they can probably likely do a much better job than mm. you, mm. then it's time to pass the reins to okay. them, right? Right. Well, I think that's, um, that's another part mm. of your chapter of mm. your life now. I think maybe now is a, it's a good time. Mm. We'll just take a short break. And after this, I'd like to come back uh, to Azran to maybe hear about his latest venture. Of course, it's in Naluri. And understand his perspectives, whether they've changed or not. So we'll be back with you very, very shortly. Thanks. Thanks for rejoining us. Uh, I'm going to come back to Azran and I'm going to start maybe touching on a, a bit about what you're doing nowadays. Mm. And again, mm. you know, the major experiences, of what I know of you, obviously, is from your McKenzie days to, to uh, Asia X and of course iFlix. Mm -hmm. And, and now you're into healthcare mm -hmm. through Naluri, from an airline tourism to social media entertainment, now to um, Naluri. Is there something that connects mm. those particular points of business or thinking about business? And then, of course, please tell us more about Naluri. Sure. Yeah, most people think I seem to be jumping across different industries mm. because people who spend time in one industry always think their industry is unique. Mm. For me, mm. in the last 20 years, I've been trying to solve the same problem. Mm. It's the same issue that deeply fascinates me that I really want to learn a lot. And different industries are just ways of applying the same perspective, which is look at an existing industry. Why are things done a certain way? How do we make it much more affordable, much more accessible, and much more convenient to the mass market segment in emerging markets? Mm. So I wouldn't have not a lot of interest in creating a premium brand right, or a luxury brand. But it's really important for me to you know, tackle this problem because one of the things that really I feel a strong sense of purpose is the challenges that we're facing in the world today which is deeply polarizing between the haves and have-nots, right? The 1% versus the 99%. Mm. And it's a, I think it's, it's a mistake to think that, oh yeah, the middle class are gonna catch up. Because those with better access to education, um, financial resources, employment opportunities, they're growing at a faster rate than the rest, right? And so mm -hmm. that gap is widening, it's not closing. Mm -hmm. So if there are ways that we can address that 99% and find ways to help close that gap, I feel mm -hmm. like that's my, that's what I really want to leave the dent in the universe, right? Wow. And so the same perspective with the long haul airline, okay, well, how does the Singapore or Emirates do things? Mm -hmm. How do we make it different, but more accessible to the mass market segment? Mm. How does a Netflix or, you know, satellite TV operator serve the urban market, but how do you create something really tailored for the mass market segment? Hence iFlix. Hence iFlix. Mm -hmm. And the same issue with Nullary. Now, the reason why I suspect Nullary really means a lot to me personally was because the genesis came from a conversation that made me reflect on the experience of seeing my own father pass away from mm -hmm. diabetes and cancer. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and when you're with someone who's going through a chronic disease. Mm -hmm. It's not an overnight thing, right? It happens yes. over years. Mm -hmm. And I was, as I reflected on it, I realized the entire healthcare system today 
has kind of three or four big problems. Mm-hmm. Number one, they were only focused on his physical care. Right. Medication, surgery, chemotherapy, mm. radiotherapy. And no one thought about or provided any support for we, what we now learned is the depression and anxiety mm. that people with chronic diseases go through. And when you don't provide that support, mm-hmm. skip chemo sessions, miss medication, right? And it just kind of spirals down. Mm. So the healthcare system today, whether it's physical hospitals or clinics, or even all these telehealth, telemedicine platforms, mm-hmm. are very siloed by specialization. Right. right? Every right. specialist doctor only looks at one part of you. Sure, right? sure. Cardiologist just looks at your heart, right. or the oncologist just looks at your cancer cells. Mm-hmm. But especially the link between mental and physical health, mm-hmm. we treat it separately. But in fact, there's strong correlations between diabetes and depression, mm. heart disease and anxiety. And it's really, mm. we think, important to look at it more holistically. And the second big problem with healthcare, you realize is, doctors and hospitals wait reactively for people to be sick and distressed, and you have to go to them. Right. Right. And by the time you go to them, it's already a late stage, mm. very expensive, very mm. complex. Mm. Mm. What would it take to flip that model and say, go out into the populations, do early health screening assessments, find people with early risk factors who may mm. seem healthy, who are still functioning, who are still going to work, mm. but they're early risk factors and help them then because it's more cost effective mm-hmm. rather than wait until they're already distressed and they can't function anymore. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the third is that there's a really big problem with the economics of payment for healthcare. Your doctor gets paid for the consultation, the prescription, mm-hmm. or the treatment, mm-hmm. irrespective of your health outcome, whether you actually get healthy or not, right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. Right? Mm, mm. Why? It's a fee for service model. Mm, fee for service. What if we could move the industry towards one that's more outcomes based? Mm, mm. Right, and that idea, interestingly, came from the airline industry. Because in the airline industry, you also have this big problem or different alignment of incentive between the airline operator who owns planes and the maintenance service provider for the engine or the aircraft. Right. Okay. Same thing with power plants, data centers, etc. Right. Because if the maintenance service provider gets more money every time you need more spare parts engineering <laughs> services to, to deal with breakdowns. Yes. They're actually interested to see more breakdowns. More breakdowns, right? yeah, yeah. But that's not good for the airline operator, right? Yeah, yeah. So you have a misalignment of incentive. And so what airlines have done is they've created these new kind of guaranteed contracts where the airline pays the engine provider or maintenance provider a fixed fee, okay? Okay. Any breakdown, any spare part change, you got to make it work within that fee. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm paying you a fixed fee, right? So it's now your incentive to make sure there's less breakdowns and less spare parts. If not, it's going to cost you more. It's not, it's going to cost you more, right? right? So you figure out an alignment of interest. Now, what if we could change that for healthcare as well? Not just for healthcare. I mean, I can, hear, I can imagine so many other industries. Of course, of course, I know. But I, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm, today I'm excited about, well, <laughs> yeah. super interesting, right? Healthcare, yeah. instead of just yeah. continuing, because cost of healthcare every year is going up by 15 20 percent yeah right imagine and yet more people are still getting sick Mm. so something is screwed up with Mm. the healthcare economic model Mm. right so rather than just a fee for service model what would it take to say hey i'm going to pay you a fixed fee it's called a capitated model it's now your interest to get people healthy because the more people are unhealthy the more treatment then you, the provider, you have to bear that cost, right? So you create a better alignment of interest between the people who have to pay for healthcare and the people who provide for healthcare. But that requires a lot of data that doesn't exist today. And that's one of Nellery's missions, is to Mm -hmm. create a lot of the early preventive health data that would allow these guaranteed cost containment models to be developed. So for example, I mean, in a bit more layman description so what i understand is that nullary is involved in uh, upfront prevention mm-hmm. versus treat, uh, reactive treatment mm-hmm. and nullary uses data mm-hmm. to help advise mm-hmm. client as well as uh, the, the the service provider mm-hmm. what else does nullary do as part of that mm. that chain of activities okay so first 
today already with mental health, mm -hmm. we've created this guaranteed cost model, right? Because mm -hmm. many organizations would only pay us a fixed fee. And mm -hmm. we have to screen people and really support depression, anxiety, stress, burnout mm -hmm. at a mm -hmm. fixed fee. Mm -hmm. So if someone needs 50 therapy sessions, it's all on our cost. Okay. Right? So we've got to therefore find them early, help them early, instead of waiting for them to be distressed. That's what we're already doing today, right? So for many companies, this is now a better alignment of interest. Kalau dulu, the more people use therapy sessions, the more your cost goes up, right? Yes. So suddenly you have a misaligned interest between the company seeing cost going up, but then you actually need more treatment for your employees. Mm. Now the next step is, mm -hmm. how do we move towards these more expensive chronic diseases, mm -hmm. like diabetes, like mm -hmm. heart diseases? Mm -hmm. And we're building those data sets, right? We're doing a lot of blood test screenings as we build uh, probably the largest data set in Southeast Asia for weight, uh, blood sugar, cholesterol, blood pressure, the profiles with age, gender, etc., you can then do the same thing, right? So how much are you spending on these chronic diseases? So these are all data yeah. that is even developed from scratch? Yeah, developed from scratch. So right? it's not data that exists in universities well, or... So the, the diagnostic data we develop from scratch. Okay. But we also then work with industry players mm -hmm. who have data, for example, six years of historical medical claims mm -hmm. uh, for 500,000 employees in 30 companies, mm -hmm. right? And then we work with HR. Hey, let's analyze sick leave data. Sick leave. Right? Because that's mm -hmm. a real cost. Yeah. It's an indirect cost. Yeah. Right? So because the insurer is only interested in direct medical costs. Mm -hmm. But the organization is also interested in indirect costs. And that indirect cost oftentimes is larger than the direct cost. True. Right? True. Because if you've got diabetes yeah. you know, or blood pressure, it's just medication. A yes. few thousand ringgit a year. Yes. Right? But if you miss five days of work, right. that value is even larger than your medication cost. Right? Mm -hmm. So how do we then put it all together mm -hmm. so that we can, for the first time, companies can see, oh, here's a functioning health economics model, I can value, put a dollar value on improving early preventive health, mm -hmm. therefore what's my cost against it, therefore what's the return on investment. Mm. Before, healthcare was just, this is utilization, yeah. and this is the cost, right? Mm. That was in the entire, whether you are the insurer or the employer, that was the only data you get. Okay. Right? So I'm, I'm sure that, I mean, th this sounds mm. fantastic and so mm. innovative and I'm sure there are benchmark uh, other organizations, mm -hmm. maybe internationally, where mm -hmm. you can sort of like measure yourself mm -hmm. against. But I just want to get a feel when it comes to come back to the startup. Maybe on a scale of one to ten, mm -hmm. Azran, how hard is it to sell these ideas, which sound so simple when we are conversing about it, mm -hmm. but yet I, I don't mean to be mm -hmm. pessimistic, but I maybe feel that people don't really still get it? 12 on a scale of 10. <laughs> 12 on a scale of 10, oh my goodness. Because we humans, for the most part, we are grounded on the status quo. Uh, we are more comfortable with what we're familiar with. Right. right. And many people might even get your idea in theory, but say, oh, too hard. Impossible, right? For example, I started by this process with just one intern. Posted on LinkedIn, hey, I'm looking for one intern to work with me to flush out this idea. Uh -huh. And our goal was, can we meet 100 people in the industry? Okay. CEOs of insurance companies, uh, business leaders, HR leaders, uh, hospital directors, specialists. To see whether the problem we wanted to tackle is a relevant problem for them. Yeah. And the approach that we want to tackle is different from what they're already doing. Right? And interestingly the most conservative and risk averse of the whole healthcare eco ecosystem, doctors. <laughs> okay. Even if the hospital director says, wow, this is a really interesting idea yeah. because I can extend continuity of care outside of the hospital. Because when patients have chronic diseases, it's not just how you treat them when they come to the hospital, but what they do at home, right? Mm -hmm. But every doctor's like, oh, no, 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 no. I don't want anyone else to yeah. talk to my patient, right? They're very possessive. They're yeah. very, you know, I, I don't trust anything digital. And maybe doctors, with all due respect, they've gone through such a, a, a dogged years of mm. education, learning something, 
to maybe unwind some of that uh, is the, maybe the biggest challenge for them. Mm. I just want to ask you, you said intern, mm. has there ever been an attempt by you personally to create more Azran Osman Ranis? Oh, of course, have, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I know you. I know you like people, and of course, you uh, you, you you build teams, mm-hmm. but. Do you find other people like you with that same level of energy and I call it kederat, you know, and in a way, never say die, fall over, go back to swimming pool with five-year-olds? I don't care. I, 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 that is my big passion, right? And so uh-huh. whether it is um, people that I, I really love to hire fresh graduates or mm. people who've just only had a few years of experience mm-hmm. and really see them grow good, right? for good. example our first full-time employee at Nullery uh-huh. Hafiz Hafiz right? yes I know Hafiz yeah Hafiz he came fresh grad right wow from Star, right and today he heads our business yeah. development team in Malaysia wow you know he's seen very his very capable compensation very. like 5x 6x 7x wow. since he first started right yeah. in just five years yeah uh, and there were many examples there were you know Tim and Natalie in iFlix and a whole bunch of people at AirAsia X. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I also invest in founders mm. as an angel investor. Okay. And okay. I'm a big believer in investing in founders that I know personally. Right. Right? Because I can see that spark, okay. that energy. So you see the same spark in Chubo Chirita. I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure, right? So, yeah, sure. you know, I love, I love uh, spending time with people who are... <laughs> You know, just obsessed about a particular problem. I'll give you one example, right? Okay. One of the, I was the first investor into a startup called Money Match. Money Match. Mm. Okay. I met the two founders uh, when they were just in a small accelerator program, you know, developing a business plan. Mm-hmm. Now, the name Money Match was because the original idea they had was to try to solve, you know, the problem of, let's say, if you want to go on a holiday in Australia. Mm-hmm. And you want to buy some Australian dollars, right? And mm-hmm. you go to the foreign exchange okay. trader in Mid Valley, right? Yes. And if let's say the exchange rate is three ringgit to one Australian dollar, they'll charge you three point one to buy Australian dollars, right? Okay. And let's say you bought a thousand Australian dollars. Okay. But you went to Melbourne and you only spent eight hundred. Now you're back in Malaysia holding two hundred Australian dollars, right? Uh huh. If you want to change it back to ringgit. You're they make lose. you go like 2.9, right? Yeah. So there's always that spread. Yeah. Right? So money match was about, could I match people who are coming back with people going oh. so that they can match at the middle, right? Okay. I was like, that's really interesting. Uh. And then the first question was, but what's the business model? Like, how do you make money from this? Oh, we don't know yet, right? But I love that they were like very fixated about the problem. Okay. Right? Now, eventually money match today, and you know, mm-hmm. it's grown on, raised a lot of capital. Mm-hmm. That, I, that first idea was shelved. It was now very focused on SMEs who are remitting money internationally. Yeah. Okay. And can you do it at a, a better exchange rate than what the banks offer? Okay. Right? So the business model will change and evolve, right? Yeah, Just no. how all of our business models change and evolve yes. once you start. But that first spark, you right. found a problem. You're obsessed about it, right? You want to get mm. going, right? I'm willing mm. to leave my careers because mm. I'm going to do this full time. Mm. Those are the founders that I love to spend time with. Mm. Amazing, amazing. Azran, you know, I mean, as it is, I, I, I know you, I've known you for a couple of years now, but there's so many insights that I picked up today that mm. continue to amaze me. And I wish to thank you so much for joining us. Maybe just one final sure. question. Um, of course, your, your boys are not grown up to be married yet, or maybe they are close. But katakanlah, right. it's Atuk um, Azran one day <laughs> was, you know, having a dinner, a late dinner with your chuchus. Mm-hmm. Um, apa cerita? Apa cerita yang you rasa that will be most meaningful to convey to them mm. about life in general? Okay. Well, you've read my book, mm-hmm. right? And you also know... I frame that whole accident experience mm. as broken crayons. Broken crayons, okay. The idea being, in life, mm-hmm. you can be a perfect crayon. Just stay in the box. But crayons are meant to color the world. Mm. But once you remove the crayon from the box, and you start to color, you know how kids color with crayons, right? Yeah. Guess what? 
the crayons are gonna break. Uh huh. But that's okay, because broken crayons can still color. Mashallah. But if you just stay in the box, yeah, you'll be perfect. But you're not gonna color you're it, and you don't color. change anyone's lives, right? Mm. So life is about not not avoiding risk. Many people are afraid of the risk of the unknown, mm -hmm. the risk of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. You got to go out there. And life is tough. Life mm -hmm. is unfair. Life is going to knock you down hard. Mm -hmm. And the one lesson we all need is to learn how to get back up. Mm -hmm. So not to avoid risk, mm -hmm. not to stay in the box, mm -hmm. but to go out there and get broken and learn to get back up. Inshallah. Thank you so much, Azran. Well done. Thank you so much. Um, it's been a pleasure. And, you know, I'm sure there may be other opportunities in future to sure. call you back onto the show, maybe on speaking on more, some other topic. Sure. But I really, really, really appreciate This is actually one of the early series in our new launch uh, of Chubo Chirita. And I, I really am happy to have you had you today. And I'm sure our listeners and viewers also will share the same sentiment. So... Thank you once again uh, for joining us today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it just as much as we did here listening to uh, Azran live. Uh, and we look forward to you joining us again for our next episode. See you soon. Assalamualaikum. Have a good day.